Okay, so we've made it to our fourth and final market structure. This one's oligopoly. Um, if you've brushed up on your Greek recently, <laughs> uh, oligo, if that's how you pronounce it, just means a few, and the opolis that we've been looking at comes from a word, pol polin or something like that, that means selling. So the word really does mean a few sellers. So one of the first characteristics we see then is the number of firms is a few. Um, what does a few mean? Well, <laughs> for our purposes in this class, we're going to be talking about like two because it's easier to deal with two firms. But it means, what it really means is that there are a handful of firms who have such a large share of the market that they actually affect each other. If one of them chooses to cut his price, you would expect in a different market structure that that would affect you just because of the competition. But this is a little different. This is a little bit more. In oligopoly, when you lower your price, you actually are changing the profit calculations your competitor is making. And so that's where we get this strategic interaction in oligopoly. And that's also one of the reasons you're going to see us using something called game theory because it's a little more complicated to figure out what's the best thing for an oligopolist to do in response to what its competitors are doing. So a few firms is a very key characteristic for oligopoly. It's, it's what makes the market structure so unique that we have to um, approach it the way that we do. So number of firms is very important. Now type of product says identical or differentiated. And so that's sort of a way of saying it's not a terribly important characteristic. We saw that it was extremely important in perfect competition that it was an identical um, good that was being sold because that's what affected people's unwillingness to pay more for your good over someone else's. They saw it as the same. And we saw differentiated was a very important characteristic for monopolistic competition because that's what made people want to pay more for your good because it was different or they perceived it as different. different. But what it comes down to is with oligopoly, it, that's not a defining characteristic. And so it can be identical or differentiated. What's more important is the fact that there's a few firms. Um, the ease of entry will be low. Okay, well, we'll think about that. That means the barriers to entry is high. So it is not easy to enter. It's not blocked. It's not, you know, completely stopped the way it is with monopoly, but it is not easy. There's something making the um, ability to enter this industry difficult. Okay, and then we also see a couple examples of the market structure where you can imagine since it's manufacturing that it's fairly substantial to get it set up, and that kind of serves as the barrier to entry. Also, with auto manufacturing, you can imagine that um, obviously it's differentiated. People feel differently about a Honda versus a Ford versus a... BMW, right? So we all have a, an impression that actually are differentiated. But you could also imagine something like pharmaceutical manufacturing or maybe even the PC manufacturing um, where you're producing something to certain standards and it needs to be identical in that sense, but it's different manufacturers that are actually producing it. So if you had a few companies, for example, in pharma pharmaceuticals producing a particular pill, it's got to be of a certain strength and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the type of product, identical or differentiated, like I said before, is not the key um, factor. It's the fact that there's a few firms and that the barriers to entry are high <laughs> and the ease of entry is low. So if the barriers to entry is high, meaning it's not easy to enter, what are the things that make it difficult for firms to enter? And so in oligopoly, we have three barriers to entry listed here. Um, one of them, the first one of them, is the economies of scale, which is along the same lines as what we talked about with natural monopoly. Now, nobody uses the phrase natural oligopoly. I just put that there to kind of help you realize that we're making a similar argument. But what it comes down to is, let's see here, if you, if you go back to the monopoly discussion and you look at the natural monopoly one, what we were talking about was there is a demand curve and a falling average total cost curve 
such that one firm could more cheaply produce than, um, than two. So it's a similar story with the oligopoly, it's just that there's room for maybe two firms. So you can imagine a longer than average total cost curve that does something like that, and there could be room for maybe two firms producing at this range or somewhere in that range. Because if only one firm tried to do it all, you start to see that to hit this quantity, you got to you got to raise your cost. So then maybe there's room for them to kind of share in this way. And that specifically would be a duopoly, meaning there's only room for two firms. Um, but the point about economies of scale is that it's, again, the structure of the average total cost curve that is determining how much room there is for the firms. So here in an oligopoly, as each firm grows to whatever its lowest cost scale is, its, its size that allow it, allows it to produce at the lowest cost, um, then in total there's only room for a few firms. All right, so that's economies of scale. Control of a key resource, we saw that also um, in monopoly. If control of a key input blocks all entry, you get a monopoly. If ownership of a key input simply makes it difficult for other firms to compete, but not impossible, you can get oligopoly. One example uh, I've seen in a book is Ocean Spray, the cranberry company, controls uh, two-thirds of the cranberry crop through various agreements they have with those people who grow cranberries. Um, so they don't have 100% control, but that is significant, and you can see that that could limit um, other firms from being able to enter because you got to have your connections with the cranberry growers in order to do cranberry juice. And then the third thing we are offering here for barriers to entry to, to help understand why an oligopoly would form as a market structure is again the government imposed barriers. Um, here again it's something that the government has done to give to, to limit who has the right to produce a product or to enter into a market. Um, you could be talking about patents um, who has the right to produce certain drugs and for how long, um, and then things maybe like occupational licenses that limits who can come into an industry and actually do the production. So that pretty much wraps up our understanding of what an oligopoly market structure is and why it might occur. Where we want to turn our attention to now is studying how we can analyze how a firm will make the profit-maximizing decision given that it faces a different scenario. It's having to deal with this interdependence. 